Uh, welcome to the afternoon session. Um, our first speaker this afternoon is um, Bradley Garden, uh, Jenden? Geddon, sorry, my pronunciation, hard G. Geddon from Synopsis. Um, he's a senior director of product management um, uh, for verification software at Synopsis. Over 20 years of experience in the EDA industry, covering a broad range of domains such as custom design, circuit simulation, digital implementation and verification in both product management and sales roles at Synopsys and Siemens EDA. Prior to entering the world of EDA, he was an analog mixed signal design engineer working on energy management and wireless communication chips. In his spare time, Bradley enjoys traveling and exploring the world with his wife, uh, preferably on a sailboat. There you are. And the, the title of his talk is Autonomous Verification. Are we there yet? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Now it's working. Uh, Thanks, Mike. Good. And uh, thank you, everybody. I know I have you after lunch, so maybe sit back, relax, <laughs> take a nap. Stay, um, stay awake. Stay awake. <laughs> <laughs> so um, good uh, series of presentations this morning. So um, definitely something, uh, no pressure on us this afternoon. So topic autonomous verification. Are we there yet? So I guess the first question is, what is autonomous verification? And who better to ask than ChatGPT. And so we typed it in, what is autonomous verification? The anticipation was killing us. And the answer came back and it seemed like a pretty reasonable answer. And I guess the most significant part of that was without significant human intervention. Okay, thank you, ChatGPT. So now, you know, taking some inspiration from some other industries. So I'm sure many of you are aware today that we have Robo taxis roaming the streets of San Francisco, aside from a bunch of other things. But anyway, no, they still have a steering wheel, but uh, they're driving around by themselves. And, um, you know, the, we're expanding that, that fleet. And uh, I'm sure many of you are aware that uh, the SAE, which acronym I can't remember anymore what it stands for, but anyway, they define sort of five levels of automation when it came to self-driving. It was actually kind of interesting because I looked at the slide when Joe and Brian from Silicon Insights put it up of the five levels of data capabilities. So I thought this is going to be a theme for today. Anyway, so, um, you know, starting from the far left with sort of no automation, you know, then you've got your driver assistance, sort of cruise control, partial automation where there's more than one task that's being automated in the car. And then, you know, level three, which is probably where we are with this. Tesla these days is, you know, the vehicle doing most of the driving, but human override is most definitely required. And the vehicle, before, you know, level four until level five, where, you know, there's no more steering wheel, no more brakes, and I guess you're reading a book. And um, back to the data capability analogy, which was on the far left, you were very uncomfortable until you had all the data and you were very uncomfortable. I think on this one on the far right, you were very uncomfortable and much more comfortable holding onto the steering wheel and the brakes. So anyway, so how, you know, can we map this to verification? Okay, so we took a stab to have some fun. So, you know, of course, far left, your person's doing everything. Then, you know, there's some first degree of assistance, you know, maybe constraint random. You know, then there's the next level where we're doing some, you know, some, a few features, but humans still heavily involved. Finally, you know, tools doing a lot of it and people are obviously still involved and then there's level five where you know it's doing all itself and you're getting to focus on much more important things on another level i don't know i didn't insult verification i didn't mean that <laughs> so so i guess we ask our question do we even need autonomous verification i mean what's the point so i think you know from this morning's presentation i mean andy made it clear you know designs are changing and uh, you know obviously getting much more complex uh, at the same time, you know, schedules coming down, you know, management wants this thing out tomorrow and, you know, six, a year is no longer acceptable. So, you know, you have to hit these uh, aggressive roadmaps. And then, you know, the number of engineers per project is not really growing significantly. So the big question is, well, how's, how's the industry doing with this? So I think the first chart is, um, you know, we did a, you know, did a survey, I think this is IBS. And what you're looking at here is the red columns are the 
probability of a respin uh, as you go to lower and lower process nodes. And I'm sure you'll all agree that the trend is going in the wrong direction. And then, uh, you know, my good friends at Siemens, together with Wilson Research, they did a survey. And of course, the number one cause of a respin is logic and functional issues. And then just further compounding the situation, there's many, many reports like this, but this is one that Boston Consulting Group did that figured out that by 2030, we were going to be short around 23,000 semiconductor uh, engineers uh, in the US by 2030. So really encouraging actually to see the work that uh, Stuart was talking to us about, about the skill development uh, here in the UK, hoping to address that challenge. But I think without a doubt, you know, anything we can do to improve verification quality and complexity, uh, definitely around autonomous verification is needed. So yes, it would be very nice to have autonomous verification. How are we doing? I'll make sure I keep on time here. Yeah. All right, so look at a, you know, a very, very simplistic view of the flow in the world, right? You have like a architectural spec, you have some people, the green circles, creating design specs, test plans, more people writing DUT, RTL, even more people writing test plans. And of course, you run the whole thing through the regression system. You get some results when things fail. Now we spend time debugging. And uh, of course, when things pass, now we want to try and close coverage. And, you know, when we look at uh, across the customer base, essentially they spend about 70% of their time between debug and, uh, and coverage closure. Now, I have it just 35 35, could be 50 20. But essentially, the long pole debug and uh, coverage closure. I remember this morning, Andy had 70% for debug. So, you know, clearly between debug, coverage, closure, uh, these tasks are taking a, a long time. So, what can we do? So, I think let's talk a little bit about coverage, coverage closure. Another very simplistic view of uh, verification. So, you know, if you look at a typical uh, constraint random flow, regression flow, you know, you're generating tests, and then from those tests, you're generating stimulus, then you run these regressions, you generate a coverage database, now you're going to look for the holes in the coverage database, and then you're manually tweaking tests or creating additional tests uh, to close coverage. So with AI, you know, what we're able to do is starting from coverage creation, can we infer coverage from the RTL and the stimulus? Can we recognize parts of the design that are more complex versus a simplistic FSM versus complex FSM, excuse me, and guide verification engineers to create more coverage in certain parts of the design? Then by connecting the coverage to the input stimulus, we understand how to reach that coverage with the stimulus. So using AI to target stimulus to improve coverage, then Regression automations are figuring out which is the highest value tests, and they're making sure you run those tests first so you get to your coverage target quicker, um, and then you can start focusing on finding more bugs. And then all around analytics. Regressions are creating tons of data. So folks at Silicon Insights shared that with us this morning. And, um, you know, how to give you insights into what's going on in your regression. Have you over-constrained any variables, uh, which is why you are unable to hit coverage. So all of these solutions together, um, you know, we call as uh, VSO.AI. Now, understandably, at Synopsys, we've got XSO.AI crazy, uh, but uh, VSO.AI, verification space optimization, is a solution we have to kind of address all of these areas and bring this technology to you. And I have millions of charts that look like those on the right-hand side, but essentially, you know, hitting your coverage target quicker, and then getting to your coverage, and then getting you more coverage, higher coverage as you continue to run the system. And I would be remiss if I didn't share even more results with you. But obviously, you know, a lot of customers seeing uh, benefits from VSO.ai through uh, increased coverage or uh, improved time to coverage target. And, uh, you know, because it's on a PowerPoint slide, it's formal proof that it's real and works very, very well. <laughs> so, anyway. Try it, you'll love it. <laughs> um, so that's coverage closure. So, you know, thinking a little bit about uh, debug. So another, I'm great at simplistic flows because this helps explain it to me. Um, so, you know, classic flow, right? You, you write some code, you check it in, run regression, now there's failures. So you started to do triage, try to figure out what's the root cause. And then, you know, you yourself, you know, you're fixing bugs, you're working with a team of people to fix bugs. 
So here again, you know, similar kind of flavor. You know, what we thought about is that, you know, with, with debug, we wanted to sort of close the gap between where you find, introduce a bug and when you find a bug. So, you know, our thinking is that Verdi needs to kind of evolve into a development and debug system. So starting at the top, we, uh, we have an integrated development environment that we call Euclid, that we've now uh, included as part of Verdi. So if you have Verdi today, you can use Euclid. And this is a development environment that includes inline linting uh, of both RTL, system Verilog, test bench. So really to try and at that first level prevent sort of basic bugs getting introduced uh, into your design at, at the onset. Then we also thought, you know, Verdi needs to actually have access to the regression management system. Because at the end of the day, you run regressions overnight. What you want is that a system to kick in when there's failures, to start rolling back check-ins, to find a passing uh, FSDB, and then starting to do some triaging so that by the time you get to work, dream of dreams, it points you right to where the bug is. But here, at least getting you closer and closer to finding that bug using AIML uh, so that you get a, a better starting point uh, when you come back to the, to the design. Um, so then, like I mentioned, AIML for uh, triage. Then there's also uh, around root cause analysis. We've also introduced a whole bunch of new debug paradigms, which I'll talk a little bit about on the next slide. And then also by collaborating. You know, Verity was very much a single user, single environment type of tool. But now, you know, being able to do your debug, get to a certain point in time, click a button, web link gets created, you email that to one of your colleagues and they can start off right where you le left off. So being able to easily share uh, the system uh, with, your, with your colleagues and friends. All around a, a, central, a central database. So around end of last year, we introduced our, what we call our next gen uh, Verdi, my favorite version of Verdi. And, you know, just uh, I would be remiss without an architecture picture to show you all the different bits and pieces. So, uh, you know, obviously it's uh, from Synopsys perspective, it's a, very, it's a debug environment, development environment for all of the engines, actually for a lot of the, the industry. I also talked a little bit about, you know, some of the new debug paradigms. So we talked about AI-based RCA, but um, I think it was Andy was mentioning, you know, a lot of... It's not just waveform debug anymore. A lot of customers are now debug, not now, have do debug with log files. And that can be kind of tedious, trawling through log files. So giving you technology to be able to read in log files, to do some visualization of the logs uh, within Verdi. And it's all temporal. So it, it will uh, you know, align with your waveforms as well. Then putting infrastructure in place, something we call debug decision tree, DDT, which is a terrible acronym. Um, so... <laughs> You know, here is our idea being, you know, create some infrastructure where you as a, say you're an expert at debugging PCIe, you know you take certain steps, you click on this signal, you open this block, based on something you do something else. So how do you record that as almost a macro? And then it's basically you can reuse that the next time you have to do a debug problem around PCIe. But the idea here is that you would create a library of these uh, DDTs. And uh, within your own company, then you can share this with junior engineers, uh, you know, or, or engineers that don't have experience in certain protocols uh, to really help accelerate debug. And then I mentioned the collaboration. So the IDE, the next little column over there. So here I mentioned already the ability to do test bench linting, design linting, and then the whole verification management system is now incorporated within Verdi as well. To, uh, for the reasons I referred to earlier, but then also adding some new technology around dashboards, APIs. And then finally, uh, Verdi has uh, had its, uh, its look and feel uh, re-upped. I hate to use the word modernized, but I'll use it anyway, modernized. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a QT5-based uh, UI. Uh, you'll see that as soon as you get the latest version of Verdi. And if you're absolutely in love with the way it used to look, there's a button to go back. <laughs> and then there's also some API for you to build analytics around, you know, what you're doing, you know, into your whole data system and your, and your own applications on top of that as well. Okay, good. We're moving along. Not too slow. And once again, formal proof that it works. So, <laughs> you know, a number of customers seeing uh, excellent results with the, the various RCA engines is what I'm showing you here.
So getting on to part three. So, you know, what can we do about specs? So, you know, we talked about this earlier on today. I mean, what is the challenge? The first thing, thing about specs is there's not normally an English spec or a French spec or a Taiwanese spec. There's also other things like timing diagrams, finite state machines. Uh, you guys in the room here know this better than I do, waveforms, images. And then what happens is you have more than one person sort of interpreting these specs and sort of, uh, if you look at state of the art, trying to create some sort of machine readable spec from, from this, maybe it's a markdown language. Um, and then from that, you know, if you look where's more state of the art today, people are developing these generator apps to take this machine readable spec and generate like HTML, RTL interfaces, um, and various other collaterals. So, I mean, the challenge you have here I always hate blaming the people, but uh, you know, it's because it's not because you have one person, but it's because you have more than one person. These things are oftentimes open to interpretation. I can't remember Andy used the word. If we had a perfect spec, it would be fine. <laughs> but um, you know, and obviously, this is where where bugs can be introduced. So, can generative AI help to remove this ambiguity and provide some degree of uh, automation? Can it? Can it? So I think at this point in time, nobody needs an introduction to generative AI, but um, you know, you've seen how it's kind of proliferated all over the place, which is the right wheel on, on the right hand side with all the logos. So the big question we're asking ourselves is, you know, how can we, can we leverage this for generative, uh, for EDA and automate the, the design process? So, uh, you know, let's do some exploring. So one, one application, which, uh, I'm sure if many of you even played with ChatGPT today is give provide it. This is something we've built into our um, our development environment is being able to provide a pragma of what you want. Uh, give me a counter from one to ten, and then it kind of generates for you uh, um, three proposals, and uh, you know you can review those proposals, and if you like it, you accept it, and it brings it back. Uh, into the tool. There's also the ability to do completion as you're writing a uh, code within the within the editor as well. So very nice application. Uh, of course, I'm not going to lie to you. The results are not always perfect. So really, here it's about improving what comes out of the of the LLM and the quality that comes out of it. And you know, there's a gentleman at at Microsoft whose last name is not spelt like that. It's B E. It's spelt like it's E-R-I-K, sorry, his first name is spelled wrong. Anyway, he presented at DAC in 23, and, you know, as, as an industry, you know, they just see that there's a there's a vision for using uh, OpenAI, of course, coming from Microsoft, selfishly, uh, many different applications, be it uh, RTL generation, very interesting is more around formal property generation, uh, logic, generating UVM test benches, um, and then also helping to optimize stimulus. So lots of potential applications that even from customer side are seeing, or at least from the open AI perspective, are seeing opportunities for LLMs. So, you know, when we think of what the different things that we're looking at and working on in various degrees of maturity, uh, first is of course the, uh, almost the uh, holy grail, well, not step one of holy, was trying, trying to take these specs and translate it into something that's, that's machine readable. Um, then sort of this idea of multi-step reasoning assistant. So for instance, if you're sitting in Verdi, can you have a conversation with Verdi? You know, can you please highlight the signal? Can you open the schematic? When did the signal go to X? Why did this fail? <laughs> so, um, you know, so having this interface into Verdi to be able to, to sort of, you know, you could do these things, but really accelerate how you work with the tool. Then code advisor. So here that thinking is that, uh, can we feed the LLM some RTL and then ask it questions? Is there, are there any security issues here? Yes, there may be, but please use formal. Anyway, um, RTL uh, analysis to check, have we, uh, are there opportunities to improve PPA? So, you know, these are some of the things that we're, we're working on there. And then finally, um, you know, generating test collateral uh, in other areas that, that we're looking into as well. So there's many different opportunities uh, for LLM. And I think that, um, you know, I was chatting to someone early on in the break, these are all very cool. And uh, the demos, we, you know, there's, they demo very well. But, you know, for us, it's figuring out, you know, what will you guys 
uh, want to adopt and use and actually find useful in, uh, in your everyday work. Of course, there's lots of challenges. Every day there's more, but uh, this, that's the challenge slide. Um, anyway, lack of public design data. So all the LLMs are very well trained on C. They're very well trained on Python, Python geniuses. But RTL, there's not that much lying around in the open, uh, open source. So you know, there's not a lot of data that uh, we're able to um, train LLMs on. And of course, as um, you know, many of you also brought up, there's the security aspect, right? So how do we you know, do we host an LLM on-prem? And then if you're doing that, you know, there's an investment required in GPUs. Um, Jensen will happily sell you a Blackwell GPU if you want one. Um, but obviously there's that hardware investment that comes with that. Uh, and there are diff different models that you can go down for LLM. And of course, we all are very aware of the, uh, the hallucinations. So, you know, LLMs are like misbehaving children. They, you know, they can give you an answer that sounds somewhat reasonable, but it's completely wrong. But I'm sure you've all experienced that. So, you know, there's many ways to address these challenges. I think with the hallucination ones, you know, the way that we are addressing this is this basically we have the EDA tools. So can we put the EDA tool in the loop as an agent so that when an LLM generates a response, can we pass it through the EDA tool to then provide feedback to the LLM on the goodness of the response that, that was generated. So definitely we see opportunity there together with RAG that having the tool in the loop uh, will help to improve uh, the quality of what comes out of the, uh, the LLM. So going back to uh, the, the fundamental question we asked ourselves, where are we on this uh, scale of zero to five? And uh, we can debate for hours but we're about, we think we're about there, where you know, we have tools that are AI enabled, that you know, helping, helping the um, verification engineers. You know, we're not at the point where the tools are doing all of the automation themselves, so maybe we're moving towards three, but we're definitely on this journey. Whether we want to or need to get to five is a good question. But um, you know, we kind of started this little chat talking about you know, what was autonomous verification? If, if those of you familiar with DALI, it generates pictures for you. So we asked DALI, you know, what does it look like when we have the full automation? Um, and uh, firstly, DALI said, you have a purple robot that's doing verification for you. And then, <laughs> then you get to focus on the important things in life. And what's important to me is sitting on a beach with an umbrella drink. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's pretty much all I had for you guys today. Thank you. How? Did you... Oh. Yeah. yeah, 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 you're good. You're good. You're good. Um, any questions from the audience first? There are some online questions, but we'll go to the audience first. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, oh. uh, the mic So my question to you is uh, uh, with regard to Gen AI, what are the prospective projects or products which you are, you know, uh, having for disposal? Or what are the projects in pipe? Yeah, we have a, a lot of different projects. I think the one that I referred to there with RTL generation, it's pretty far along. I think, uh, you know, the co-pilots in the tools. So, you know, we, we actually had a press release late last year on building what we call the knowledge assistance, which is really trained on the, on the documentation. And uh, so kind of co-pilots within the tool. So those are furthest along. And uh, there's many, many others. Um, unfortunately, our R&D folks come up with like five new projects every day. So trying to control that's kind of challenging. But uh, <laughs> yeah, and like I said, I mean, I think for when I look at it, you know, it's really finding those sort of high value problems that we can solve. Okay. Yeah, but good question. Thank you. You are still relying on MRS. So, but people are, uh, as far as I know, maybe my knowledge is limited. People are tending to move away from MRS to RAG. Is it so? If yeah, it is, no, why? yeah, ours are also RAG. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, there's one question, question on those. Uh, any more in the audience before I go on those? No. Um, how would you apply AI um, in coverage correction, functional coverage correction? Right. So what we were talking about early on was um, where we're analyzing the coverage database, and then it learns on what stimulus 
is connected to what the cover bins in your design. And by learning on that, uh, it can then manipulate the stimulus to hit the coverage that it's not hitting. So the AI loop is looking at the coverage, connecting it back to the, the stimulus, and then learning what that stimulus can, can impact in the coverage model itself. Sorry, just a quick uh, uh, comment on this. Is it relevant for bigger designs like server SOCs or client SOCs? As long as you're collecting coverage, it's relevant. Some, like some, some people don't really look a whole lot at coverage, functional coverage at the SOC level, more at IP. But if you care about uh, functional coverage, uh, code coverage as well, actually, code coverage too. Um, it's a, it's a, a tough one. Uh, how many years will it take to get fully autonomous verification? Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe, <laughs> when will we all be, no, we'll be focusing on what's important, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Level five, we're, well, look where we've come in the last 10 years. So maybe we're five, 10 years away. Well, I don't know. It's debatable whether we'll ever get there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. And is there a, one last question? Is there any um, uh, push to get anything vendor neutral for integrate for you know AI integrating results to, into an AI platform so people can start to? Yeah, that? I mean vendor neutral. Like we, you know, we support the UCDB. I think uh, I think it's best for everybody if you can mix and match and uh, be able to use the best from everybody. So I think something that we would fully support. <laughs> okay, there you are, fully support. Okay, thank you very much.